So before I begin, I'm going to explain kind of what Merge Ships is and what it does, because I know you all know what it is, but just a refresher course. Um, it is a fully staffed hospital ship, and it will cruise around mainly West Africa, and it provides free health care for people who can't afford it, uh, free surgeries, cataracts is a big thing, and also enamel tumors, which here in the States, enamel tumors aren't a big problem because you can see them when they start growing as a child and get rid of them. But over in Africa, they can't do that, and so they just keep growing and growing. And without the proper care and treatment, they will finally grow and kill off the host. And so uh, Africa Mercy actually sails around and provides all free health care. Uh, we provide teaching for doctors so that when we leave, we don't just abandon them, and they kind of understand how to better treat medicine and other ailments. Um, and so right now I'm going to kind of explain about my trip and how you know it felt when I first got on the ship and then I'll let Marlena um, tell how it kind of when she first saw the ship what she thought uh, and I joined the ship in Los Palmos uh, Gran Canaria which is an island chain right off of Morocco and when we were there when I first got there we thought we were going to go to Benin and while I was there, we were going to go to Benin, Congo, the DRC. We just kind of kept changing around because of Ebola. And so when I got there, I had no idea where we were going. Um, and I got onto the ship, and the first thing you kind of see is, with the ship is this gangway and this little kind of alcove, and on it, just like this. And when you go up the stairs, you just kind of, it's a little overwhelming because I've been flying for about 18 hours. <laughs> And the first thing they do is they want to take your picture for your ID card. So, you know, that's the first thing. That's what ca actually came out of it. So I think it could have been worse. <laughs> um, and the first thing I thought when I got on the ship was, like, I'm finally here. And then I thought, I'm very tired. I need to go to bed. Um, and so it was just very, it was a big ship. Or to me, it was a big ship. It's actually a smaller ship from what I've seen in the other ships. But very big ship, I thought, I'm going to get very lost, and I also, I know no one. And it was a 200-person ship, and I thought, I'm not going to make any friends. <laughs> well, when I arrived, and I arrived in Madagascar, so I think it's three or four months after Nash had been on the ship already. And um, when you come into Madagascar, you do not come to where the near the ship is. You, you fly into the capital, which is Tana, and you take an 11-hour bus ride from Tana to the ship. So by the time you get there, you've been traveling for three, four days, and you see the ship, and you're so excited to get off this bus. It is hot. It is muggy. The heat, you're just not used to it. So you get off, and like Nash said, this gangway, it is daunting. And I was like, oh, okay. You start walking up the stairs, and I'm like, this thing is so long. I, need to, I just want to get to the top. I just want to have dinner. I just want to rest. And I came with a pretty large group of people because we're on this, on a, like, because we came in big groups on this bus. So it took a while to get all our paperwork done. And what was really scary for me was because when I got in there, they're like, your name is not on the list. Like, you're not here. Like, wh why are you here? And I was like, oh dear. Like, did I come at the wrong time? Like, what have I done? No, I got on, so I got on the ship and I was talking to one of the hostesses that was helping me and she's like, oh, the same thing happened to me. And I was like, oh, phew, like, I'm not the only one, right? So we got through, got my ID and went down to my room. And the ship is different than what you picture. You see pictures online before you go, you read up on it and you go there and I, you're brought down. And for me, I was like, wow, I'm sharing a room with nine other girls. This is going to be an interesting experience. And yeah, it, it's a daunting at first when you come because there's so many people and everyone has already their friends, but it just how welcoming everyone is to you really just shows the community that is on board. So the first thing I did um, after I slept about 10 hours um, <laughs> is they kind of bring you up to show you where you're going to work. Now, I worked in the galley, so I got to help chop food and you know create food for everyone to eat. And the way they explain it is, oh, you're just going to feed 400 people. My first thought was, yeah, that'll be easy. <laughs> um, and so it's a group of probably you know six people on one team, and they have to create food for the whole ship. 
And while we were in Gran Canaria, that was a little bit easier because there's only about 250 people on board. Um, so, and I thought that was hard. But when we got to Madagascar, we had to feed about 700 people. So, you know, I was in for, I was in for a ride. Um, and they kind of explain it. And your first day is mainly just going through all the basics, uh, getting any training you need out of the way. Um, and so the first couple of days, I was just following what everyone else was doing. Um, and then they actually made me the cold side team leader day five of uh, being on the ship. And so I just had to learn how to make salads and run you know, two other people um, while they chopped vegetables and made salads. And I didn't know how to get to the dining room at that point. So <laughs> running people was a bit of a challenge. Um, but I kind of I worked through it, and I had a great staff. They all already knew what to do. Main, many of them were nurses that had come up uh, before me, uh, because since we didn't have the hospital open, they took the nurses that were already there and were staying there, and they just kind of put them in different positions. And so they already knew what they were doing, so I just let them do what they were doing, and I just kind of stood back and hoped for the best. Um, and so during Gran Canaria, we, like I said, we went through so many different countries. Um, Ebola was just kind of going through all of West Africa, and we didn't want to go anywhere in West Africa because for most people in Africa, we're a big brand. They know merchant ships, and they know what they do, and so we're their last hope for whatever they have, and we can't treat everyone. And Ebola, we aren't, really, we aren't capable of treating, and so we didn't want to go into Benin, which was then un unaffected, and have people from the neighboring countries that were infected with Ebola come to us thinking that we can help them and then infect the country. And so we just kind of sat around and it always, we have a meeting every Monday morning and they'd say, oh, we're gonna go to this country. So we all got very excited. And then we have another Thursday night meeting and they say, hey, we're actually not going to this country, we're gonna go to this country. <laughs> and so it was like that for about a month. Um, and we finally were like, okay, well, we're just not gonna go anywhere. We're gonna do a PR trip around Europe. And so a little disappointing for me, I was kind of excited for Africa, but you know, I was like, okay, I'll still be on the ship, it'll still be exciting. And then, uh, just right out of the blue, um, Madagascar said, hey, we're open. Um, and it turned out that the managing director, who kind of just runs the ship, his wife's brother was actually the prime minister at the time. So we got to go through the legal channels, which usually takes about two years and about two weeks. So, you know, we finally were like, okay, maybe we can do this. We, we started getting our hopes up. And by Thursday, when they didn't say we're not going to Madagascar, we started really getting our hopes up. Um, and then it was all official and we finally started sailing. And sailing, I thought I was ready for it. I had done sailing in high school. It was nothing like that. <laughs> um, at first it was smooth and you could walk down the hallway and you know, it was okay. And then we finally hit rough water and you tried to go in a straight line and you just be kind of zigzagging your way through. Um, and so we sailed from Gran Canaria down to South Africa and Cape Town. And Cape Town was awesome. It's definitely a place I want to go back to. It's very modernized, but you leave the city and it just goes right into what you picture Africa. Um, it's a little wilderness, a lot of huts, um, and it was, a, it was very cool to explore around and just see what that was about. We stayed there about two weeks, and then after that, we started sailing to Madagascar. And if I thought the sail to South Africa was bad, the sail to Madagascar was even worse. Um, we that's went through, when we lost the that's when we lost the cappuccino machine, our biggest loss of the ship. <laughs> um, we were sailing around and stuff that had been bolted down had been broken loose and we're kind of going everywhere and the cappuccino machine actually fell down. And this is, this is Los Palmas. Um, so there's, it's very pretty. And actually, this is the Atlantic Ocean. So I, what I thought is, I just keep looking, I'll see Norfolk eventually. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, when we were sailing up to Madagascar, it was rough and no one slept. We were all pretty much zombies the entire time. Um, nothing really got done. Lunch and dinner was just bread and some meat, if we could slice it. Um, the cappuccino machine fell down and I remember the next day they were trying to fix it and it just wasn't working. And people would come up and say, oh, can I have a coffee? Oh, we can't, we can't make those. And you just see their just face drop. They're like, <laughs> okay. And they would shuffle along. And I just, I felt so bad. And Starbucks <laughs> finally donated a new one. So we don't, we got our coffee back and people got their hopes back up. But when we, f we got into Madagascar 
and we actually had the president come and visit and see the ship, and he had all of his officials, and um, it was a big uh, shindig. And it was actually the year of the volunteer that we were there. So it worked out pretty well. And since we are volunteers, they wanted to just introduce us and kind of have uh, us be their staple head for um, the festival. And so we had about 50 to 100 people hop on these vans, and we all went down to this town square. And these are some shenanigans from South Africa. We said we were going to Madagascar, and all these kids got so excited. They'd all seen the movie. They all got so excited to meet the lions and the zebras. <laughs> and the next thing the captain said, as soon as he said we're going to Madagascar, is, it is not like the movie at all. And you hear all these kids go, aww. And so they did have, this is, uh, we had a Madagascar kind of night. And so we kind of dressed the ship up uh, and had a little party. And the kids, you know, dressed up as different characters from Madagascar and they danced around and had a good time. And so that's what they did. Um, and so, but when we, got to Mad when we finally got to Madagascar, we had about 100 people sit and they just spoke Malagasy, which none of us knew. So they were speaking this language that I had no idea, but you could hear mercy ships throughout. And so they'd be doing these rapid, you know, just words that I had no idea. And then you hear, they'd stop for like a half a second and say mercy ships. And they'd go back into their, they'd just switch back into Malagasy. And so you kind of understood they were at least talking about us. Good or bad, we didn't know. Um, and then while we were there, they spoke about us, and then they wanted us all to walk around. And so we would walk around, and they'd all say, oh, come look at us. Come look what we're doing. And so it would be you know, this group of homeless women that would sew, and they'd have little sewing things. And they'd be so excited to show us just what they were making. And then we were like, well, we can't pay for anything. And they said, no, no, we just look. And uh, so we kind of walked around and looked at everything. And they have beautiful crafts. They know how to just make everything. Um, none of it's really machine made. All, they make everything by hand. And it's all made, most of it's by wood or tin and stuff. And so if you see their houses, it's uh, basically a hut made out of planks of wood. And they have just a slab of tin on top for a roof. And that's what they live in. Um, and I actually got to go to one of their houses, Emma, which is one of our day workers. So we, when we get to a country, we hire local people to come on board and work for us. And it kind of helps stuff along. And they get to sort of ease us. They get to teach us the language and teach us their culture. And then also when we go out, they can, we can see them around. And they get very excited to see us. And they'll run over. And that's a lot of fun. And I got invited to a, one of our day workers, Emma's house. And so I went in. and. They have like a, this dirt floor, but they will sweep the dirt floor. They get very clean. Um, and if, so when you walk in, you'll track dirt in. And they will sweep the, the loose dirt out, and so they have the hard, compact dirt. Um, and they, they get very excited about everything, to show you everything. They will make you this seven-course meal just because you're coming over. So it was a lot of fun to go over there um, and just meet everyone. And so I had a lot of fun doing that. So when I started, I also worked in the galley. I did not work initially with Nash, but my first days in the galley, we had celebrated American Thanksgiving. And it was my second day of work. And we were putting out this big meal, turkey, like this, that, this huge spread. Like it's like having Thanksgiving at home. And it was crazy. And here I am, so out of my depth. And I'm just like, so do I chop cucumbers? Do I cut turkey? Like, what, what, what am I supposed to do? And you just, you just kind of follow the crowd and just hope for the best. And it was, it was it's really a, like you walk in there and you, you just know you're going to be out of your depth. So you just got to accept that everything is going to be out of your control and just hope that you will figure it out. And that's how you, you figure it out. You just got to go in there and ask questions and just learn by doing. And when I arrived in the ship, we were already serving 700 people. It wasn't like with Nash, where you come in and you serve 250 people and you work your way up. But by that point, we already had the day crew, like Nash said. And the day crew, they are amazing people. Like, I think that is what made the experience for probably both of us so meaningful, is the day crew. They're just lovely people. They're friendly, welcoming. And like, you would just, they're so open about everything. Like, they want to talk, they'd be sitting in, the galley, and they want, they want you to come to their house. They want you to meet their family. They want, they're like, oh, you should go check this out in Tomatov, and you should see this, or you should do this. And that's what 
like really makes your experience because you come in there as a tourist knowing nothing about this country and they're just so welcoming and so kind and and good to you and yeah I think that's also like what when I look back and people say well what was the best moment or one of the best moments and it's like the whole thing is what makes it so good but those people really are the ones who make it so meaningful because you go and you and you go out into town and you see they have nothing and for them just having rice and maybe a little piece of chicken is so is this a normal meal and here we are Thanksgiving with this huge spread or Christmas I also worked another huge spread and then you see how much we have and we're just like oh we have we have these few leftovers what are we going to do with oh we'll just we'll just chuck it out and they're like well can we take these bones home and can we use them for a soup or can we have these plastic containers to go use them at home and for us we're like Oh, sure, of course you can have them, but we would just go chuck them in the recycling and not think a thing of them. Or we wouldn't use this old yogurt container to keep some spices in. We would buy a special container for it, right? And you just, stuff like that, you begin to see the differences. And, yeah. Um, this is also Cape Town. And that's Lion's Head. And so that's just a big mountain. And it's actually taller than the cloud line. And so as you see the clouds, just, they try to make it over. And when they finally do, they just start falling back down. And so it makes for very pretty pictures. I have a few of those. <laughs> um, also, while I was in Madagascar, I actually went up, I got to go up to the capital and work with them. Because like Marlena said, you can't fly in Tamatav. The airport's just not big enough. Um, so they fly in from Tana. And then we have a group of two people that live out there, and they will pick them up from the airport and take them to a hotel, and, which is just someone's house. Someone just open their house to people and let people come stay there for the night. Um, and then the next day or the next couple of days, they'll get onto the bus and they'll come to the ship. And so for me, it was me and this woman, Kathy Long, who had been on the ship for about 20 to 30 years. So I was thinking my nine months was very long, and she was like, I remember when we were on the Caribbean Mercy, and 1980, and I was like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and so we just, we lived in this house uh, that we rented, and we had a van, and so we'd just go pick them up. And then we'd also pass stuff through customs. We had containers of um, food and containers of medical supplies that we'd have to go through customs. And we'd have to get visas for everyone, and that all had to be done in the capital. And so that lent to be my job, because Kathy loved to just go pick people up. She was a very friendly person. She loved very personable. She loved to meet everyone. And so I got the bureaucratic duties. <laughs> um, and so to get into the city, it's probably about five kilometers, you know, about three, four miles into town. And if I didn't get up at 6 a.m. and leave by 7, I wouldn't get there until noon. Um, and even after leaving at 7, I didn't get there until about 9, 8, 8.39, uh, just because there was so much traffic. And we found out while we were there, if it m is on the road and it's moving, it's allowed. Um, they had carts, they had bikes, they had ox carts going down, they had bicycle carts, they had people just kind of walking, um, they had push carts. And so we decided, well, if it's moving on the road, you kind of give it its own little space and you just sit there and wait for it to kind of move to the side or wait for the other side of the road to pass and you just pass them. Um, the rules of the road of, Madag of Madagascar were very open. Um, there, was not, there was no speed limit. I didn't see one speed limit sign when, while I was there. I think I saw one stop sign and a few street signs littered around. So really, no, no rules. Um, and it's probably about a wa as wide as the two-lane highway here, but there's no divider line. And so what you'll end up having for is two people side by side kind of driving. Someone trying to come this way. You'll have the bikes and all the carts just kind of just engulfing everything else. And so just it's craziness. But it works for them. I saw about two accidents the entire time I was there. So whatever happens, they get it done. Um, and so Tana was a great experience, though, because I got to just see the rest of it. Um, when you're on the ship, you can really just kind of stay on the ship. You, you don't have to leave. You don't have to go down to the hospital. So if you really wanted to, you didn't have to see Madagascar at all. Um, and so I think when I first got to Madagascar, I definitely was a little shell-shocked. Oh, this is when we lit the kitchen on fire. 
Um, when you steam stuff and then you open it, there's steam that comes out. But uh, something had happened where they didn't steam it correctly or something, and it actually melted a little bit of the fridge. And of course, our head chef was there, just, and he was the one making it, so he had to make up excuses on why you know, he was melting the, um, the ovens. And so that was, a, that was crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, while I was in Tana, it was mainly just uh, seeing the rest of it and people who, you know, that was their life. You know, because in Tamatov, you don't have to go out there, like I said. You don't have to ex have the experiences. You don't have to talk to the day crew. You can just kind of be by yourself. And so I was very shell-shocked going into Madagascar. I had been up in Tana, so I kind of had to start accepting that image. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could just see how little they had and how excited they were to have anything. Um, the big thing right now in Madagascar, they had solar heating. And if they did, they would tell you for days that how they had solar heating. So if the power went out, you would still have hot water. And they were so excited of just about that. And here, I'm like, well, we don't really lose electricity, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and, but they, anytime there's a thunderstorm, you start saving any work you were doing. You start turning off all the lights because you're going to lose electricity at some point. Um, and it's just the whole city would lose it, not just one little area. Um, and so while I was in Tana, I would go in, and we had a local day crew that kind of helped us translate and stuff, because by then I knew maybe five words of Malagasy. Um, so she would go in, and she would explain what we needed uh, to like, pass this through customs or get this passport out. Um, this person was coming this day, so we needed to do this. And we would just do it. And it worked out. And their big joke there, because they really don't count themselves as African, they count themselves as Malagasy, and they're very proud to be Malagasy. And so they say they're only a thousand kilometers short of being a continent, and so they're growing their mangrove trees out to get that last a thousand kilometers. And then that's, they love to talk about that. Um, and so while I was up there, uh, they get very, we say, hey, you know, I'm in Africa. They say, no, you're in Madagascar. Um, and they're very Malaysian. They have a very big Malaysian influence because back in the times of wooden boats where they had to sail with the wind, um, Asia and theirs countries could get to Madagascar easier than Africa. Don't know how that worked, but it somehow, so they kind of populated before Africa even knew it was there. Um, so when you go around, you definitely do see a lot of the Asian influence and a lot of, um, like they grow their own rice. And that was a big thing. Because apparently with the rest of West Africa, um, for all of Africa really, if you don't have rice with a meal, you didn't have that meal. It didn't count. Um, and so they have rice every meal, and, but they import their own rice. So they don't grow their own rice there. And so everyone that had been on the ship for other African countries and had come here were very surprised that they grew their own rice and they kind of in exported some of that, but they mainly ate all of their own rice. Um, and so, yeah. So, like Nash was saying about being on the ship, well, he was in Tana, I was there for, I had my first month on the ship, and it, it's easy to get wrapped up with everything that's going on. There is so much. So, he is secluded from the rest of the ship, and ship community is a big thing, because those people on the ship are the only people who understand what you're going through. Because your family at home, they want to know what's going on, and you explain it to them, but they don't understand. You try to explain what it's like to have your work two, sto two sta like stairways up, and okay, cool. Well, well, they don't understand, and so you, you can connect with the people on board, and you talk to them, and um, Monday nights, they always, they call it Monday fun day, they had stuff for you to do. There was always people to hang out with, and people at like meals who are welcoming, and yeah, it was easy just to get wrapped up in your work. Same as at home, just to always, just every day, get up, go to work. But then you have to stop and think, why did I come here? What am I doing? And working in the galley, we work with these Malagasy people. And so you, you a register maybe a little bit more than some of the other jobs. But it's still easy to get stressed because we didn't get the lettuce we need for the salad. So now what am I going to do? I just have eggplant. And no one wants to eat just eggplant. Or no one wants to just eat this celery. So you just you, you get stressed out about that. And it just becomes a big deal when it really it isn't. Because you have to think about 
what is going on downstairs, a couple decks below. And then, oh yes, we're having these surgeries and all this stuff is happening. And we are contributing to this even though we do not get the lettuce. People are still have something to eat. And sometimes just to like wrap your head around that and just you need to like just take a reality check. And um, yeah, I had the, and I observed a surgery because it was an amazing experience because I'm standing here and the patient is like right in front of me and the surgeon is explaining exactly to me what is happening. And to just know this is what's happening every day, just floors below, it's just unbelievable because you, you, you can just like, Nash said, you get so wrapped up, you just, it's just like everyday life, you can forget about what's going on. And also, when you're on the ship, you forget what's going on in the outside world. People will be like, oh, this happened at home. I'm like, oh, really? I could tell you like, what happened with everyone else on the ship, but to really make a point to know what's going on in the outside world, you have to go and read the news. But it's so easy to be secluded, and you are like away from reality. And to get off the ship, it's easy just to get stuck and hang out with all the people on board and to not go and explore. And I think at first, it is kind of daunting. I had been to Africa before. But still to go out and you can you, they recommend you go out with one other person at least because it's a little bit safer so you go out and you see the market and you interact with these people and you barter for what you want and and of course they're going to try charge you more and it's just like an interesting experience and at first it, it's just so daunting to go out and see these people and talk uh, try to talk to them because there's a language barrier they they know french and they'll try to speak to you in french and you end up just counting on your fingers. Well, I want this for 7,000, and no, no, no. And sometimes they still don't understand that, so they type the numbers into their phone and show you, well, this is how much they want it for, and no, no, that's way too much, right? And the longer you're there, so when you have a longer, like Nash was there for like six months longer than I was, but even th being there for three months, you, um, you get to know the country more, you get to know the people and how the system works, and when you, you go out, and by the end, you, is not like, I don't want to say scary, but it's, it's not intimidating to go out and be in town. Like, you feel like you know your way around. You know how to get to the market if you want. You know how to get to the beach if that's where you want to go. If you want to go out for dinner, you still, you know how. And that's how you experience the culture is going out and, and, um, and just experiencing these things. And on the ship too, there's like a little bit because you have the, the day workers and Tuesday nights we had our Malagasy nights and we made the food that they had, but it's still not the same, right? This is going on a little longer than I thought. Um, so I'll just skip. Basically, we had one big surgery, and his name is Simbani. And I have a little testimonial. Um, and he had a tumor, as you can see, bigger than his head. Um, and it was heavier and just a ginormous tumor. And so this man walked two days from his village with his son and to a car and drove to the ship just because he thought we could help him. Um, and at first, we decided w we can't really help this man. He, the tumor is just too big and too inclusive. There's no way we can get out without killing him. Um, and so here, I'm going to read a little testimonial that we got. And so Dr. Gary Parker, who if you've seen anything about Mercy Ships, he's probably the doctor you've heard from. Um, he's been there forever. And he does a lot of the general surgeries. And so he wrote this testimonial, and he talked to Sambani about this. Um, the man trembled up our gangway and did something extraordinary. He changed our lives while we were changing his life. Over the next few weeks, his name was spoken across Africa's Mer Africa Mercy's eight decks. Thousands of tears and prayers ascended to God. And social media exploded with his story. What was so special about Simbani? Around 36 years ago, a tumor began to consume Simbani's life. It became a, monstros a monstrous burden weighing about 7.46 kilograms, or about 16.45 pounds, equivalent to two extra heads. After nearly, three decades of face sur after nearly three decades of facial surgery, Dr. Gary Parker, the chief medical office officer on board uh, the Africa Mercy, says, it's one of the biggest tumors of this type that I've ever seen. The tumor caused unrelenting discomfort. Sometimes it felt like hot fire, somebody said. I cannot sleep at night, and even during the day, it heated me up. When walking, it's too heavy. I have to hold it. The tumor was also an emotional burden. 
Family and friends rejected him, mocked him, laughed at him, shunned him. Some thought his condition was contagious. Harsh words were flung at him. Why are you still alive? No one can help. Hopelessness defined his life. The search for help required traveling hundreds of kilometers, included 10 hospitals, only three of which had surgeons, and a witch doctor. With no success, Simbani's poverty blocked any other option. His despair reached new depths. He says, I was waiting to die. I did not, know, I did not do anything. Every day, I was just waiting to die. So Simbani's world shrank to the size of his house, his only place of safety and peace. Eventually, he became so weak that his life became a monotonous cycle of waking, sleeping, and eating. He felt useless, and it, was hard to watch, and it was hard to watch his family laboring in the rice fields while he wasted away. They were useless. Oh, wait. They were poor, and money spent on trying to help him was money unavailable for food. Simbani's main companion was the radio. One day, he heard the announcement that hope a, of hope. A hospital ship that could treat tumors were for free was coming to Madagascar. In spite, his, in spite of his weakness, Simbani told his family, die or survive, I have to go. It was a journey that only a desperate man would attempt. The closest road was several days away, and the ship was hundreds of kilometers away. Simbani struggled to walk around his house. How could he survive such a journey? But his family recognized his desperation and, and determination. They sold a rice field to pay for the journey. Five people took turns carrying him on their backs for two days. Then Simbani endured a painful six-hour taxi ride, but he finally made it. Due to multiple health concerns, Simbani's surgery would be extremely high risk. For almost two weeks, he rested as the medical team determined the best course of action. Meanwhile, his story spread throughout the ship. It made its way into our community meeting, when all were asked to pray. It appeared as, the sign, as signs on doors asking us to pray and to give blood, it lent its voice to concern requests for updates. It traveled into people's dreams, dampened many a tissue with tears, and prompted some to go hungry as they fasted for this stranger from a country far from their own. Simbani had penetrated our lives. Then, with one word, Simbani's life was changed. After a lifetime of hearing no, 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 he was delighted when the medical team said yes to performing this difficult surgery. Simbani was well aware of the risk. I know without the surgery I would die. I know that I might die in the surgery but I already felt dead inside from the way I was treated, so I chose to do the surgery. The surgery took over half a day, and over twice of his body's volume of blood was lost and replaced. Our crew, our living blood bank, literally poured life into Simbani. The blood of 17 people from six nations now runs through his veins. Dr. Gary described the surgery, oftentimes in operations you have high stress moments where you're in the middle of something where in that moment, if something goes wrong, you could lose the patient from severe hemorrhaging or something. With Simbani, it was pretty much high pressure the whole 12 hours of surgery. The end result, Simbani was finally free from the burden that had weighed him down for nearly two thirds of his life. And the ship exploded with, praising, with prayers from God. We had helped transform Simbani and he had helped transform us. A group of us watched breathlessly as Simbani looked at himself in a handheld mirror, seeing himself for the first time without his tumor. With his head wrapped up carefully in bandages, he looked into the mirror and said, I like it. I'm happy. <laughs> Later, he added, I am free from my disease. I have a new face, and I am saved. A little over a month after his arrival, Simbani and his faithful grandson, Flavi, made a special appearance at our weekly community meeting, triggering thousands of thunderous applause and a red carpet moment. Everyone rose to their feet to honor this courageous man. Together, we had fought a battle against his death and by the grace of God, he had won. Dr. Gary says, I think that every human being has the right to look human, to be treated human, and to have a, a place at the table of the human race. And when you've been deprived of that seat, and it's offered to you again, to be able to re-enter the human race and look like everyone else, well, that's just a fantastic thing. And so this is somebody now. This is without the tumor. And so, there's a picture where he has all of the blood donors, and you can just see everyone was just there. There it is. And these are all the people that donated blood, um, and Simbani in the middle. And I do not know. Um, it was a rare, a yeah. rare type of it was yeah. like A or A or something. Yeah, A, yeah. B, probably something. Yeah. But um, so these are the people that could donate, and they all donated. Um, I think we have a video. I think that's coming up. Yeah. And my favorite picture 
is there's a picture of him and he's holding the mirror and it was like the first time he looked in the mirror and he just immediately started crying just because he couldn't just see without the tumor. You may have to uh, narrate because I'm not sure this will be Okay. And this is Dr. Gary. And this is when he had first gotten on and they're walking him down. Mm -hmm. It had been growing out. So you can just see how wide it is. <coughs> so this is one of our nurses. This is the community meeting. He can move his head now. So that was Simbani. Um, and while he was at the village, like I said, no one said hi to him. And when he got on the ship, he was just bombarded with people saying hi, and how are you, and can we get you anything. And so he, when he was talking, there's, I was in the video, he said um, he was so thankful that people just said hi to him. That's what he was most excited about. And so that's Mercy Ships. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? What did you say the name of that tumor was? Um, I'm not sure the name. It was, it, they called a maxofacial uh, surgery, so I'm assuming it was like a facial tumor. You said an uh, enamel tumor earlier. Enamel tumor, is, that's just the common one in Africa. I'm not sure if he actually had that one. Yeah. Any other questions? He gained full motion on his head. Yes, he will. <laughs> um, so right now, that's kind of what it looks like. And then he's going to go back next year and kind of see how everything's working and see if they can kind of touch up to make, a, make it look symmetry. Yeah, basically. But right now he can turn his head and he can look up and he can look down. So he's got full motion with his head. Is he now able to work? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he's going to be working when he gets back just because right. of the surgery. And I'm, I'm not sure how the doctor said, but right. he can definitely start moving around now. He can walk. So, yes. He was about 37, I think. He was in his 30s. Uh, for both of you, <clears throat> after having uh, been away and doing this work, what is it like to come back to the United States? <laughs> what do you notice? What, what, uh, what kind of lenses are you looking through to see? Um, I've noticed, A, how wasteful we are with a lot of things. We, you know, stuff that when I was here, before I even went there, I was like, okay, we can just kind of throw this away. You know, a little portion of food that I wasn't going to eat and I didn't want to save, so I was like, oh, I can just throw it away. Um, you know, if I had did that, done that there, they get 
they'll eat it. They, you can give it to them and they'll say, oh, we'll eat this for days. Um, and it can just be a little, little bit. Um, and I've also noticed how big our portions are. We, you know, if you ever go to Why Not, and instead of using like one scoop of pasta, they just make the whole bag of pasta and that's what you get. Um, and so that's what I've, I've also noticed that driving can be very boring with all the signs and regulations. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for me, coming back, um, I found that life here is very fast paced and when you're in it, it doesn't seem like that and then you come home and we would make plans to go out and we're going to leave at two and Nash can tell you this because I was probably the worst person and it'd be like two hours later and we're <laughs> still on board the ship and we will leave two, three hours late and it's not a big deal there. Like everything is just, you know, just see what happens. Like. Take your time. If you're having a conversation with someone, you don't cut it short because you need to be somewhere at 10 o'clock. You just continue your conversation. You're a little late for the next thing. And people accept that, and it's fine. And just, like, I think that makes, like, we're, we're so rushed and fast-paced. And I've been back two and a half months now, and I'm ready. I, I'm noticing I'm getting back into that again. You start to adjust. But the first, like, month, it's just, it's mind-blowing how fast everything mm -hmm. is. And, like, the, so in Canada, speed limit, 50 kilometers an hour. I was like, this is so fast. Mm -hmm. We're just flying down the road. The speed limit for the highway is 100 kilometers an hour. And I was like, like what's <laughs> going on? Like, <laughs> this is just crazy, right? So it just things like that. And like going, you just go to town. I went to the mall. I was going like, to send some stuff to people back on the ship. And I was like, like no one greets you when you walk into like, it. Well, it used to be like the bazaar of the market, and now no one greets you when you walk into the mall. No one's friendly. I want to be outside. I want to. I want to barter for this toothbrush I'm buying. I don't. I don't want to pay the three dollars, right? Just little things like that. And the longer you're back, the more you get used to it. But in the back of your mind, you're still like you're still there. Yes. Do you all have kids um, Have a vision of what you might do next? Uh, well, I go to school first. And um, right now I'm thinking of majoring in international relations with a minor in a language and just seeing where that takes me. Um, but I'm sure once I get to school, it's just going to completely change. <laughs> but we'll see. Where are you going to go? Lynchburg College. Mm. Um, for me, this experience, I, I want to go back to Africa. I'm mm. going to go back to Africa. I don't know when, yeah. but it's going to happen. I, I, like Nash said, <laughs> I'm also going to start university this year. I'm studying business. And I don't know if that is really like the, the job I want to do, and but I'm gonna I'm gonna see what yeah. happens. I but I know that Africa holds a place in my heart, and I'm going Probably back there. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to university? Uh, university of the Fraser Valley. Of where? The Fraser Valley. It's in my town. I've never heard. <laughs> where? It's up in Canada. Oh. <laughs> yep. All right. Any other questions? Will y'all hang out here after we mm -hmm. close and then uh, do the Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, all for Thank you for having us.